Okay, good afternoon. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon again. We are now ready to begin the session, afternoon. The plenary is entitled today is the role of the international community in the promoting a just solution. Before starting, I'd like to appeal to our speakers to stay within the 15 minutes time limit set by the organizers so that we would enough time, with some time to, uh, for discussion. Our first speaker is Mr. Mohamed Shtai. Uh, he is president of Palestinian Economic Council for Research and Development and senior advisor to President Mahmoud Abbas on negotiation with Israel. Mr. Shtai has had a, uh, had a distinguished career and was a member of the Palestinian delegation to the Paris Economic Talks with Israel. In 1995, he was appointed as the head of the Palestinian delegation to the multilateral talks of the Regional Economic Development Working Group. He also supervised the Palestinian presidential and legislative election in 1996 as the Secretary General of the Palestinian Central Election Commission. Sir, you have the floor. Good afternoon. I know your stomachs are already relaxing, and I would like your attention for more dessert that you have enjoyed for the wonderful lunch with the hospitality of the government of Turkey. Mr. Chairman, I would like to thank you for the kind words that you have mentioned in relation to me. And I would like to thank the Committee on Labor Rights of the Palestinian People because actually what you do is you constitute the accumulative memory for Palestine at the United Nations. Now, coming to uh, my part of the talk, I would like you to pay attention to three important dates. 1947, 1948, and 1967. The issue of Jerusalem vis-a-vis -vis these three dates has a distinguished character in relation to the proposed solution to the question of Jerusalem. In 1947, with the partition plan of the United Nations that has been authored on the 29th of November 1947, Jerusalem was considered to be with a special status, what was referred to as the UN partition plan as Corpus Superatum, under the trusteeship of the United Nations. So Jerusalem was considered to be neither part of the state of Palestine nor part of the state of Israel. It was considered to be with a special case, Corpus Superatum. In 1948, the, with the creation of the State of Israel, the city was divided into two parts, West Jerusalem and East Jerusalem. And in 1967, when Israel occupied the city again, the city of Jerusalem, we have seen the different presentations of the different maps all of this morning and of yesterday, the city of Jerusalem is only six square kilometers. And after the occupation of the city in 1967, Israel has expanded the borders of the city to become 75 square kilometers. So therefore, when we speak about Jerusalem, there are three Jerusalems vis-a-vis -vis the geography of Jerusalem. There is this Corpus Subratum, which has very well-defined territory that goes from Abu Dis to Ain Karim. And there is the 1948 Jerusalem, and there is the 1967 and beyond Jerusalem. So the 1967, the city had six square kilometers, with four kilometers what is referred to as the no man's land. Four kilometers of no man's land. 
After 67, with Israeli occupation, Israel has extended its laws and regulations to the city. And it started to change the reality of Jerusalem in three different directions. First of all, the demographic composition of the city has been changed in two ways. Less Palestine, as less Palestinians as possible, as more settlers as possible. Through less Palestinians, through deportation, demolitions, and what they call the taking away or withdrawal of the Jerusalemite IDs for those who have been absent for more than three years beyond the borders of the city. The whole purpose with, in uh, uh, combination with land con confiscation and expropriation, the whole purpose was to make the city look Jewish, what we call the Judaization of the city. The other important landmark in the history of Jerusalem is related to the Oslo 1993 agreement. The Oslo agreement has considered Jerusalem to be one of the final status issues in addition to settlements, borders, security, refugees, and so on. But also there is an important clause in the Oslo Agreement that does consider the fact that no party should prejudice the final status shape of the Palestinian territories. Now, Israel realizing that there might be talks related to Jerusalem decided to create a de facto vis-a-vis -vis the city. By March 22nd, 1993, a total closure was imposed on the city by putting military checkpoints at the main entrance and Beit Hanina and other places. Which means that every single Palestinian is not allowed to go into Jerusalem except those who have permits. And the number of Palestinians who were enjoying permits was no more than a few hundreds and so on. So, four million... By the way, this practice is until today. And then, in addition, by the year 2002, we have seen the presentation of Wendy and Dr. Mahdi and others, that Israel started to build and construct the wall. The wall, by the way, is much longer than the Berlin Wall, and it's much higher than Berlin Wall. Berlin Wall was only in certain areas, you know, six meters, eight meters. The, the, the Jerusalem Wall is 12 meters in, in, in different areas. So in 2002, the real construction of the wall surrounding the city, and in addition to this, the process of what has been referred to as the deep of the city, has also reflected itself in the closure of the different Palestinian institutions, even though the exchange of letter between Yasser Arafat and Ishaq Rabin mediated by John Holst, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Norway at that time, who mediated the Oslo Agreement, has stated clearly that the Jer Jerusalem institutions should continue to function under the auspices of the PLO. The talks didn't go anywhere. The Madrid peace talks was supposed to launch the peace process, and the Camp David talks in the year 2000 was supposed to conclude the peace talks. In Camp David, with Yasser Arafat, Ehud Barak, and Clinton, there has not been really reached an agreement because of what the Israeli demands were. Just to summarize the Israeli position, the Israelis in 2000 sought of Jerusalem the way to solve it is some sort of sovereignty for the Palestinians on the mosque and the holy person with sovereignty of the Israelis under the mosque. And issues related to the Western Wall, or what the Israelis refer to as the Wailing Wall, and issues related to the city. 
with President Clinton coming up with his parameters, Clinton summarized the issue of Jerusalem in mainly two points, among others, the most important two points. He referred to the sovereignty over and, and uh, below and above. And then in the surrounding of the city, he stated that what is Arab in Jerusalem becomes part of the state of Palestine, and what is Jewish in Jerusalem becomes part of the state of Israel. That's how he settled the issue of the settlements around it. Now, remember one important thing. When the peace talks started in Madrid, October 1991, the number of Jewish settlers were 190,000 settlers. Today, the number of Jewish settlers in the Palestinian territories are 631,000 settlers, including 268,000 Jewish settlers in the vicinity of Jerusalem. So, therefore, that shows you the colonization program that was meant to create a de facto on the ground to make the issue of Jerusalem very complicated and that it is not an issue of settlement. We all know, with all these measures that have been taken against Jerusalem, the international community has been very clear in its position when it comes to Jerusalem. I would like to refer you to the case in which an Israeli man went to, to court in New York asking the court, asking the American authorities to add after his birth certificate that he was born in Jerusalem and that Jerusalem is in Israel. The court in New York has ruled that Jerusalem is not part of, the, of, of Israel. And I think that was based on the political position vis-a-vis -vis Jerusalem of the American administration. Now, I was part of the Palestinian delegation who was engaged in the last peace talks. The Palestinian delegation were two people, and I was 50% of the delegation. Let me tell you what was on the table for Jerusalem. First of all, the head of the Israeli delegation, Madame Tsevi Livni, she said, we have good news to you. I am ready to discuss Jerusalem. And then we said, okay, tell us what do you have for Jerusalem? Then the other person of the Israel delegation, Mr. Itzhak Molcho, he said, well, all what we will tell you about Jerusalem, that it is the eternal capital of the Jewish people, it has been so for the last 3,000 years, and it will continue to be the case. Of course, we consider this not to be very serious. From our side, what we said is the following. Either you, the Israelis, choose to go back to the 1967 border and consequently Jerusalem will become part of the state of Palestine. They said, no, 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 no. We are not ready to be part of this because the issue of Jerusalem is not an issue of borders. There are so many other issues related to it and that needs some discussion. Then we said, like what? They said, of course, the holy sites and so on. And then we said, well, the issues related to negotiation of Jerusalem has to do with West Jerusalem and East Jerusalem. Jerusalem as a city of Jerusalem. It has to do with the borders of 1967. It has to do with the no man's land. It has to do with the settlements. And it has to do with the religious sites. These are the issues. In order for you to settle the issue of Jerusalem, you need to settle these items under the discussion of Jerusalem. So the Israeli delegation totally rejected the idea of going back to the 1967 border. Mr. Chairman, we wanted to be creative. And therefore, 
we throw another idea on the table. We said, let's have Jerusalem as an open city. An open city. What does open city mean? For us, an open city means that you have West Jerusalem as the capital of the state of Israel. You have East Jerusalem as the capital of the state of Palestine. Under one municipal umbrella to provide service to the people. But the most important side of the story in order for you to have a Jerusalem, we need to redefine the city of Jerusalem. What are the borders of Jerusalem? Where does Jerusalem stand? Is it the 1947 Jerusalem? Is it the 1948 Jerusalem? Or is it the 1967 Jerusalem? So we need to redefine the city in a way to have some sort of a special arrangement for an open city when it comes to municipal service, when it comes to customs, movement of goods and people, on Savaita, and so on and so forth. The Israeli delegation got crazy about this idea. They said, well, we are here not to talk about Jerusalem of 1948 borders. Whatever is ours is ours, and whatever is yours, let's share it. So that was the concept of the Israeli negotiations when it comes to the city of Jerusalem. Now, and then here comes the international mediator of the United States. When it comes to Jerusalem, the United States it tried to give us lip service, language. So in a letter that was addressed to our president that says, the purpose of these talks is to establish a two-state solution on the borders of 1967 with mutually agreed swap. And when it comes to Jerusalem, the Americans wanted to say that a Palestinian state with its capital in Jerusalem, and speaking about in a UN forum, it does remind us all what Lord Caradon has drafted in the resolution 242 and the debate that was related to 242 that says Israel has to withdraw from territories occupied in 67 and not from the territories occupied in 67. So there was a big debate about the article the, whether the Israeli withdrawal from the or from la territories, the French text in relation to the English text. So the Americans came with this idea, a Palestinian state with its capital in Jerusalem and not with its capital as Jerusalem or as Je with Jerusalem as its capital. Why? Because for us, if the text says with Jerusalem its capital, we know what we are talking about. We are talking about East Jerusalem, the city of East Jerusalem. The American definition of the city is the Israeli definition of the city, which is 75 kilometers square. So if you say with, Jer with its capital in Jerusalem, it can be Shu'fat, it can be Beit Hanina, it can be Abu Dis, it can be anywhere else, but not the city of Jerusalem. And therefore, the Palestinian delegation has insisted that when we refer to the capital of the state of Palestine, it has to be stated that the capital of the state of Palestine is East Jerusalem of the borders of 1967. That is where we stand on this issue. Mr. Chairman, I would like to conclude by saying the following. In my opinion, there will be no state of Palestine without Jerusalem as its capital. We know how sensitive Jerusalem to all. And we never wanted to enjoy a monopoly for the city. And we, but we never wanted to sacrifice a sovereignty of the city. Because with us allowing a right of prey and religious rights for all, we are not in a position to sacrifice the sovereignty of the Palestinians on the city of Jerusalem in the same way that we would like to enjoy sovereignty of Palestine all over the Palestinian territory that has been occupied in 1967. From now on, 
us going to the United Nations is to protect the process of the Judaization of the city. And I would like to mention to you that this Israeli coalition has employed every measure in the process of the de of the city in order to come to a situation in which the city, you have nothing to talk about if there will be a resumption of the peace talks in the future. That the issue is settled on the ground and not settled on the negotiating table. And I hope that we come to a situation in which the, the international community will really play its role in the protection of the Palestinian heritage, culture, sovereignty, and political rights. And that this city of Jerusalem will continue to be not only, you know, a song for Arab singers or a verse of poetry in an Arab poem or whatever, but really the city of Jerusalem, it needs a serious intervention in the same way that all the Palestinian territories need an, an international inter intervention. What Israel is trying to do today is one single thing, is to maintain the status quo. What is the status quo? A split between West Bank and Gaza, a continuation of the colonization program, bring as many Jews as possible into the Palestinian territory, increase the number of the settlers from 631,000 to a million, and I would like to mention to you, sir, that today, demography speaks for itself. 29th of April might be, might be the death certificate of a two-state solution. The number of Jewish people living between the Mediterranean Sea and the River Jordan is 6.1 million people. The number of Palestinians who are living in the same geography between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea is 6.1 million people. With the highest birth rate among the Palestinians in six years' time, which is in the year 2020, the number of Palestinians living in this area will be 52% of the total population. So Israel has to choose between a win-win situation, which is a two-state solution, which we are ready for, and Israel becoming an apartheid state, that we are slipping into a one-state situation. I'm not speaking about one-state solution. I'm speaking about an apartheid state created by de jure and de, and de facto. And therefore, this will be a missed opportunity for peace in, in the region. Now, from our side, and that's my final point. From our side, what we are trying to do is to break the status quo. How do we break the status quo? One, reconciliation, which is a must. And I should mention to you that by the end of this month, there will be the formation of agreed upon government, West Bank and Gaza, and all political factions. Second important element of breaking the status quo is the internationalization of the Palestinian question in relation to the different UN organizations and international agreements. We already grouped the thing, the organizations and treaties into tranches. The first tranche was a benign, didn't hurt anybody. But we want to hurt the Israeli occupation. And the third important issue is that we want to see the function of the Palestinian Authority changing in a way that it will lead the passive resistance against the Israelis. Without having the Israeli occupation costly, without this Israeli occupation having a serious cost at the Palestinian level, within the Israelis and at the international level, I think Netanyahu has no interest whatsoever in having a successful peace talks. So altogether, we should make the Israeli occupation costly in order for us to have a win-win situation, which is a two-state solution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to thank Mr. Shtai for his important contribution, reminding us of the difficult uh, crossroads to negotiations Current are. I uh, agree with um, 
uh, your assessment uh, that any permanent settlement of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict need, uh, need to provide us for a just and comprehensive solution um, on the stat status of Jerusalem. In the meantime, it's crucial that the international community continues to mind Israel of the illegality of the occupation of the East Jerusalem. And I thank you once again for your presence here and your most informative presentation. Thank you. Thank you, okay, thank you. and uh, our next speaker is uh, His Excellency, Dr. Desa Perkaya, Indonesia's permanent representative to the United Nations in New York. He also serves as one of the vice chairman of the Committee on the Inalienable Rights of the Palestinian People. Prior to his appointment, Dr. Perkaya was his country's deputy permanent representative to the United Nations in Geneva, Switzerland, where he was also accredited to the World Trade Organization and other international organizations based there. Mr. Pekaya has held a variety of posts related to multilateral diplomacy and international security since joining the Minister of Foreign Affairs in 1986, most recently that of a Director of International Security and the Disarmament in the Directorate of Multilateral Affairs in <coughs> Jakarta between 2007 and 2009. We are pleased to welcome you as a panelist in this important meeting, sir. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for the very kind introduction. Uh, let me begin by expressing my sincere appreciation and thanks to the government of uh, Turkey, to the OIC, as well as to the uh, Committee on Palestine for giving me the opportunity uh, to speak on this uh, uh, subject. My focus of uh, presentation is on the role of the UN, the OIC, and other intergovernmental organization. However, <coughs> Allow me first, um, Mr. Chairman, to uh, state Indonesia's uh, position with regard to Palestine and Jerusalem. First, my country, Indonesia, does not have diplomatic relations, and we are not going to open diplomatic relations with Israel until there is one independent of Palestine. That's the basic tenet. Secondly, East Jerusalem is the capital of independent state of Palestine as envisaged in the Arab Peace Initiative. And lastly, Israel as occupying power has to act according to international law, protecting civilians not, and not changing the status of Jerusalem. There are two key points of departure. First, the issue of Jerusalem cannot be separated from the peace process and in the long run, finding a just solution for the status of Jerusalem is part and parcel of comprehensive settlement on the Palestinian question. And listening to the previous speakers today and yesterday, and also based on the Israeli policies and activities on the ground, we are fully aware and there is sufficient evidence that Israel has systematic and sustain efforts to permanently annex East Jerusalem. Now, uh, let me uh, brief you and share with you how the discussion and it at the United Nations. I think it is going to be a bit boring for Ambassador Riyad Mansur, who has been uh, there for long with me. Uh, but at least uh, I need also to highlight, if you look at the principles of the Charter, there is one important issue, one important element related to Palestine, which is what we uh, referred to as self-determination. And in General Assembly, I think uh, there have been numerous uh, General uh, Assembly resolution. Uh, I think there has been mentioned 181 and then uh, 3, to, uh, 3 to 37, 242 and many others. I think there have been a number of resolution from uh, General Assembly. Uh, the creation of committees, our committee as well, in 1975 the creation of special committee to investigate Israeli uh, practices on human rights, and annual resolution on Palestine in the General Assembly, uh, second committee, third committee, fourth committee, so there are many. There has been also reference with regard to uh, Jerusalem in the General Assembly, and also annual uh, resolution from the General Assembly, particularly on Jerusalem, which among others 
consistently declared the city as under Israeli occupation. Security Council, I think this is also the main body in the United Nations that has produced uh, important resolution. I don't need to detail again, 242, 252, 478, 1397, and many others. ECOSOC, this is also one of the uh, main bodies in the United Nations that have discussed uh, 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 the issue of Palestine and Jerusalem. ICJ, with the very famous uh, adversary opinion in 2004. The role of uh, the Secretary General uh, as the voice of the UN that encourages uh, peaceful solution to the conflict. And Secretary General, do not forget, he is also part of the quartet. In the Human Rights Council in Geneva, I think this is also a very important issue that they are addressing. And lastly, uh, not exhaustive, uh, UNESCO in, in Paris, they have also addressed the issue of Palestine, especially uh, Jerusalem. Now in the OIC, I think apart from the United Nations, we do also have uh, another uh, body, another important cooperation, the Organization of Islamic uh, Cooperation. I think they have also a very important role in this regard, and even the rationale of the establishment of the OIC is also Palestine. And on other things, uh, the third one is uh, non-aligned movement. I think uh, what we regret up to now since its establishment, Palestine remains member of NAM and the only country that remains under foreign occupation and not fully attain independence. So again, the issue of Palestine and Jerusalem is very high in the agenda of the non-aligned movement. From those uh, uh, body, United Nations, OIC, non-aligned movement, I think the primary role of those organizations and movement, first I, I could identify upholding the rules of international law and the principle of peaceful settlement of dispute, non-use of force and right to self-determination. Two, keeping the issue of Palestine alive and high on the agenda and attention of the international community. And three, which is very important as well, acting as a persistent objector to the facts created by Israel on the ground on the basis of invalidity and contravention to international law and also to delegitimate Israeli action in the field. Next, uh, strengthening the international alliance uh, against Israeli occupation and compassing white actors, state and non-state actors as well. And certainly those important cooperation or intergovernmental cooperation act as a forum to express and respond to the Israeli uh, action. We have done a lot. It has been discussed, the issue of Palestine and Jerusalem in a number of bodies, but the question is, are they effective? I think this is a big question that we need to, to address. The reality in the field, unfortunately, we can and we need to, we have to say it, it is not effective. Israel to co has continued to defy various UN resolution and even those General Assembly, even Security Council, is not, it has no uh, consequences with regard to the Israeli uh, defiance or non-compliance. Non and certainly, what I can say, I think those actions, those resolutions are not enough, and what is missing, lack of enforcement to make Israel comply to those resolutions. Um, Certainly, uh, this cannot be uh, separated from the international, the dynamics of international politics, uh, what we call it double standard, uh, ap applicable to uh, certain countries, to Israel, but not applicable to others. I think this is very strong. And secondly, if you look at the negotiation process as well, there is what we call it a symmetric position between Palestine and Israel. And to be honest also, when you look at the, the role of United uh, States acting as a just, acting, uh, acting as an impartial uh, mediator, I do not believe that happens. Um, certainly also the strategic relations between the US and, and Israel. Again, I think uh, I, I am a strong believer in the art of diplomacy, on the primacy of diplomacy, and what is important, we should not only uh, confine ourselves, restrain ourselves on the track of government, but we do also have to increase our effort 
in the second or, or multi-track multi, uh, uh, diplomacy. The way forward, if I may perhaps uh, put forward some of the suggestion first, we need to continue and strengthen first track, building systematic second track, lay foundation for multi-track, and emphasis on business communities, media, CSO, and ordinary people. The issue is not only government, but it is the issue of everyone. Second, to target ordinary people and try to influence their views on the question of Palestine. Targeting the people is sometimes the best and most effective way to influence the political parties and government. In this regard, I would like to underline the importance of uh, movement, especially in countries that have diplomatic relation with Israel. Certainly, the UN has worked on its own, OIC has uh, worked on its own, uh, not line movement, but there is also a need to synergize to make it uh, coherent in their effort to support our Palestinian brothers and sisters. And there is also a need, I think, to strengthen alliance with non-state actors. Uh, this is uh, very important, especially civil society. And more than that, the importance of the voice of women and youth are very critical in every country. Uh, from yesterday's uh, discussion, I think there is also a call, which I could agree, a need to uh, establish the presence of UN and OIC in Jerusalem. I think I can fully concur with that, and we need to do something with that. And also what is important, to create a strong narrative for peace, appealing to all people. The narrative of vengeance will be less appealing for people in so many countries. For example, the Palestinian, the Palestine recent accession to several key international agreements, including human rights instrument, is a powerful message that Palestine is ready to abide by the international law. This is a very good and noble show of good faith in which Israel is not in a position to make. On other things, we also need to increase awareness all over the world to focus on activities with impact on the ground to move beyond just discussion and drafting statement. Certainly, I fully concur as well with, uh, I think earlier with uh, Mr. Isaac, uh, there is a need to, to, to have, uh, to, to what we call it, to look at and review the current format of negotiation, not only US, uh, Israel, and Palestine, but Quartet is also one of the, 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 the best options so far, and also creating a stronger role of the United Nations and lastly, my suggestion is to re-energize re -energize the existing uh, discussion on the issue of Jerusalem in various forums designed to culminate in the convening of a special session of the General Assembly on the status or on the situation of, uh, in Jerusalem. In closing, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think we need to continue and increase our support uh, to the Palestinian cause. At the same time, we also need to broaden our constituents and increase our critical mass of pro-Palestinian, not only on the numbers, but more importantly and equally important on action, on real action in the field. Again, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. His Excellency, Ambassador Perkaya, for his very important contribution to our topic and valuable work uh, for the Palestinians, especially through his active, uh, your active work within the uh, committee. Okay, now uh, our next speaker is Professor Mohammed uh, Tajeddin Al Husseini. He's a teaching international law at University of Mohammed V in Rabat, Morocco. He's, a pre he's the president of the association from 20 uh, 21st for the dialogue and development and the vice president of the executive council of the Center for Andalusian Studies and Dialogues Between Civilizations. A member of the commission of the eminent personalities of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, Professor Hussein serves as an expert to the Academy of the Kingdom of Morocco and is wise, widely published. He is currently vice president of the Council of Foreign Relations Morocco. 
So you have uh, the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Hadarati Sayyidati Usada. La yashukku ahadu al-yawm fi anna qadiyya al-Quds. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, uh, thank you. No one questions today uh, the status of Jerusalem. Uh, there's a political religious conflict, and it's about relations between Palestinians and Israelis, in spite of all attempts made by Israel in order to Judaize the holy city and its attempts to uh, absorb it. Uh, Jerusalem will remain Islamic. And ever since Caliph Omar uh, ibn al-Khattab uh, ruled it in the year 638 after, um, in the year 638, Jerusalem uh, will be forever the main destination, third holy site of Muslim pilgrims. However, it appears that Israelis are attempting by every possible means to turn this battle, uh, moving it from its sovereignty to a different framework, to a religious framework, which would uh, mean that they are using uh, fictitious symbols to trap the international community. And such a trend is a very great threat and danger to any attempt at a settlement. It will therefore uh, build, it will lead to apartheid, and a war will um, break out. The Israeli strategy in general, I think we can say about it that it has waged great battles in relations in the area. There was the 48 war, 67, 73 war as well, and I couldn't even add the war of 1982. Uh, but it appears that the Israeli plan, in fact, has parallel dimensions in the same trend. It's yet another choice, and uh, I'll explain what I mean by this. Uh, the political plan is after a series of negotiations between the Arabs and the Israelis, it appears that this uh, breakthrough began with the Camp David uh, uh, Accords in 79, when it was uh, when Egypt was isolated from the confrontation with Israel with it from the Israelis, and then we noted that the Israelis attempted to make new gains either through the Madrid Conference or through the Oslo Agreement, where the slogan of Gaza Jericho first was the predominant slogan. More attempts were made during the Declaration of Principles in Washington in 1993, uh, which made the question of Jerusalem an issue that was not at the highest uh, level of importance, but rather something that would be dealt with at the very end. And there had to be mutual recognition between uh, among Palestinians and other things that Israel would gain from. What we can see that this final situation, about this final situation, is that it has not, in fact, become clear. We have noted how Israel uh, is putting us in front of a fait accompli and is, uh, of course, drawing maximum benefit from the fact that time flows on. And uh, it has managed to uh, establish the settlements. Uh, uh, and it has said that Jerusalem is a unified capital, an eternal capital. M even more than this, it adopted the slogan of the Judaization of the state, thus attempting to expel Palestinians in the future. I don't want to go into uh, very fine details, but to settle the question of Jerusalem, I'd like to say to settle the question of Jerusalem requires us not to go backwards on what we've already achieved, not to go back on it. In other words, we have to go in the other direction. We have to go forward, move forward. We have to be aware of the challenges of the uh, all of the uh, questions relating to the issue of Jerusalem. One shouldn't forget that Israel is uh, 
because there is a destabilization of forces at this very moment, uh, Israel is benefiting from this. International community has experienced a general economic crisis, which was, I think, which could be described as unprecedented. And this is why we must uh, take on board the fact that a comprehensive balance of powers, which up until very recently had only one single power, has now led to several centers of power. Thus, we have this competition between these different centers of powers and the destabilization of the powers. And all this has deleterious effects on the Palestinian situation and on the question of Jerusalem. If you add to this the Arab Spring, which regrettably has turned into a uh, very cold winter, a glacial winter, I think the Palestinians during their negotiations will pay the price. Uh, correction, the Israelis will pay the price. However, this doesn't uh, mean that we shouldn't think about the future and what it should look like and what are the possible scenarios for this holy city. Um, how does the, how can the international community uh, face down this intransigent uh, position from uh, the Israeli side and how can international organizations deal with such a situation? Now, as far as the first um, power center, the scenarios uh, which have been assumed as possible scenarios for the question of Jerusalem are stagnant. And uh, we have two scenarios, hope and uh, despair. As far as the hope uh, scenario, that one is based on international legitimacy, international law, and they stress uh, above all, the possibility of the internationalization or the division approach, whereas the despair scenarios can only uh, be the result of the continuation of the status quo, pursuance of the status quo with oppression, occupation, and hegemony and on and all of its uh, concepts. Now, as regards the internationalization concept, you all know that Resolution 181 adopted by the General Assembly of the UN in 1947 uh, established the main lines of the establishment of Jerusalem when it said that it uh, is under the, uh, um, the sponsorship of the United Nations during in that resolution the borders were also mentioned there which go out to all the way out to Bethlehem but this project uh, this plan uh, on internationalization has not seen the light of day yet and couldn't. The Israelis threw out that uh, plan, uh, but in, sp in spite of this, Israel has occupied an area which goes beyond the uh, division project that was decided on. So about two decades, uh, when the Pope visited uh, the uh, Morocco and a statement that he made, he referred to what he called Jerusalem. However, the latest developments uh, in the church have clearly shown that this trend will not actually actually emerge for one simple reason. The church has adopted a very clear plan to separate what is political from what is religious. The church has uh, considered that it was better to s normalize its its rapport with um, relations with uh, Israel and have an exchange of ambassadors and so on. The second scenario, when we're talking about the hope scenarios, that is the, the second one under the hope scenario is the division. Now, this hypothesis has a, has a logical basis. The idea is to revert to the pre-67 um, war borders. And now everyone accepted Resolution 242, and I entirely fully with the reference made by uh, Mr. Mohammed earlier when he talked about the nature of the conflict carried out by Israel to uh, justify and explain that resolution and the differences between the two versions, the English and the French version, where they talk about territories and the territories. This shows clearly to the international community the type of 
approach or method which is used by uh, Israel in order to achieve its goals and which of course are uh, unacceptable and intolerable for everyone. When we look at the issue of the division, we note uh, that Israel has attempted during all of the negotiations to postpone this question until the bitter end for one simple reason and that is that Israel refuses any division. You will recall that Israel even refused to have the body of, uh, the, of ex-president Yasser Arafat that he, uh, to allow him to be buried in Jerusalem. So that is, I think, um, helps to understand the, uh, this. Now, the despair uh, scenarios are the status quo which is Israel's position now. I don't need to come back to the details of this and uh, uh, the details of the geographical uh, and the economic situation, the population of the city and even the implementation of the Israeli law and the changes in the municipalities. I don't need to go into all that. All I need to say is that at this time, there are no differences between the parties who could negotiate with the Palestinian uh, side, including the uh, Likud, because the, the, the Workers' Party, uh, in its rhetoric, refers to Jerusalem as being the soul of the Jewish people, and it needs to be uh, retained as a unified uh, city. And this is why, and turning now to the reactions within the Israeli community or the Knesset, there's no hope in the future whatsoever to accept the idea of a division. But what we need, I think, to note and to note very carefully today is the changes in the U.S. position. Here, I think it's important to note that the United States, particularly the Congress of the United States, voted in favor of transferring or moving the ambassador of the, United, the embassy of the United States to Jerusalem. We note also all secretaries of state of the U.S. consider a unified Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. And this is a very dangerous development because the United States always were thought to be on the, even on the Arab side as the uh, uh, sponsor of the peace process and the mediator who uh, are, would be capable of uh, having um, plans and outcomes and solutions. I unfortunately don't have enough time to get into the nitty gritty of what I call the scenario of the open city. Uh, all the details of this. This is one of the obstacles or traps, actually, uh, which is dangled in front of the Palestinians because it might, uh, because Palestinians might think, for example, that this is a wonderful thing that it would be open from a religious point of view, but it will be hermetically sealed from a political point of view, and in terms of the exercise of sovereignty, it will be sealed. Let me move to the second um, platform. Uh, which is associated with what needs to be done to face this situation. We all note that Israel is the party which is benefiting directly from uh, the uh, from time. Time is on its side. It annexed Jerusalem, West Jerusalem in 1948, and East Jerusalem was annexed in 1967, and it has destroyed numerous monuments in the uh, Moroccan quarter, for example, uh, the uh, uh, honor quarter. In 67, it burned down the Al-Aqsa Mosque. In 1982, there was a lot of destruction. The list is very long of monuments that have been destroyed destroyed, to say nothing of the question related to the humanitarian aspect and the expulsion of Palestinians and the fact that documents have been confiscated uh, in great numbers and uh, as well as identity and so on. And Vassal al-Husseini, who referred to the uh, hegemony of uh, Jerusalem, which is linked up to three measures, the first one being to isolate Jerusalem from its economic, geographic, but also humanitarian environment. The second stage of this plan is the physical expulsion of the Palestinian uh, citizens and the confiscation of, the, uh, of their identity as citizens of Jerusalem. And the third stage is to replace them uh, with uh, Jewish settlers. And I think that these stages, which 
who have been referred to already by uh, Faisal al Husseini uh, still stand and they're predominant in Israeli practices. I think that the current situation requires us to have a comprehensive strategy with cooperation with all of those who are uh, well intended in the international community, have good intentions. In other words, first that we could present uh, is to set up put in place an international convention to uh, preserve, maintain the holy sites in Jerusalem and in Palestine. And I am saying this well aware that there is, we have the Hague Conven Convention, uh, 1904-1907, the other Hague Convention, and then the Geneva Convention, 1949. We have the fourth Gene Geneva Convention, which protects the places of uh, worship in conflict zones. And I'd like to state that all of this did not make it possible for the international community to deal in an effective way, in a forceful way, and to face the exactions or abuse from uh, Israel in the holy city. And this is why I think it is possible to note and to say that all of these elements basically uh, are leading towards a state of war. Uh, we can also note that the uh, that, uh, uh, international law rooted in Europe, which have led to, which led to all of these elements, cannot actually protect the Islamic and Christian holy sites. And in much the same way, or in parallel with this, we could note that such a convention could, might delegate direct uh, competence and could actually um, uh, uh, take this to the ICC, also strengthen the role of the Security Council. The aim there being to uh, impose a law for entry into these holy sites. It should come under uh, Article 7 of the uh, UN Charter. Of course, such a convention could ensure that a sanction would move to another stage because these issues are not well covered by uh, UNESCO. In other words, they would have to be dealt with by the Security Council. It could also ensure such a convention that the legal follow-up would go from, national, from Israeli national law to the ICC. There's another point that I could touch upon. And this relates to the development of the methodology of preventing standardization or normalization and the boycott. The question of the embargo sanctions that should be imposed on Israel is something that we have actually gone beyond. We're looking at offices that have been set up, opened here and there to cooperate with Israel. And we are quite surprised and shocked, in fact, which go, go beyond relations mentioned in 67 or 73. In fact, it it is the international organizations that have to take a step backwards, go backwards, and consider the question of having a boycott, imposition of sanctions, in particular with the failure of the Security Council to adopt resolutions along those lines. We can draw lessons from everything that was done by the European community through its regional integration uh, powers. It has been possible to impose sanctions on Israel as well as this. We can actually look into the possibility of cooperation with other regional powers, either at the uh, level of the Arab group, uh, Islamic group, but all of this being done within the framework of the OIC and within the framework of uh, certain groups that have uh, that have a, a different array of powers, such as the movement of the non-aligned. All of these uh, groups, uh, uh, such as free exchange, could undertake steps which are similar to those which are taken or have been taken by the European Union and could even develop them further in the future. The third uh, main pillar uh, relates to the reformulation of a strategy to better uh, protect the holy sites. I think we're all convinced today of the supremacy of the power of the media in all areas. I think that Zionism has 
certainly been able to uh, benefit from it, and it has uh, realized how important it is, the media. So it is why it has created an alliance with the extremist Christian uh, movement, and it has been able to affect in this way the um, holy sites. In fact, this environment that we are experiencing, uh, living in uh, today, uh, encourage us to explore the space of the media in the West thanks to a plan which is based on convincing uh, arguments. And we have recommendations from international organizations to protect the uh, holy sites. And I think that would be sufficient if we know how to market this uh, and how we can carry out a veritable campaign to denounce apartheid and to explain what it means to uh, affect negatively the holy sites. We have the Arab League. We have a number of organizations that should work at least towards uh, putting together a political, social, uh, economic atlas that reveals the dimensions, magnitude, all the ramifications of the Judaization plan. And it could put together a comprehensive plan showing since 1948 and all the way up until now, where was Israel back then in 1948? How was it born? Uh, how was it established? Where does it stand today? I think it's crucial, very, very essential to do this. Even more so, I think that we should go move towards much more effective sites, uh, on websites on the internet. They need to be uh, commercialized. We need to download, uh, rather up upload uh, documentaries and images that would actually show us what the real situation is on the ground and reach out to all those concerned. Public opinion is a very powerful vector for the adoption of decisions in, develop in uh, Western countries. And I think that um, then, then we have the fourth pillar that I wanted to touch upon, if I may, now. And that fourth pillar is about the establishment of effective mechanisms that should implement the resolutions thus far. We are going to be looking at all the recommendations and resolutions which have built up up to now so that we can classify them in the archives. But I want to see what we can apply to. Up to now, none of the resolutions have been applied. Resolutions have just been adopted, as have resolutions, but we don't know how these resolutions and these recommendations can be applied. This is a fact today, and we need to have a common body, common to the various organizations who can work together to see how to implement the resolutions that they adopted among themselves. And this could be a good effort which would contribute to implementing these resolutions. I must say that in Morocco, in January last, in Marrakesh, under the auspices of King Mohammed V, there were more than 30 resolutions. Some of them were very important. We just need financial support and political will if these resolutions are to be put into effect. If they are, they'll be very effective, particularly concerning the citizens, Palestinian citizens in Jerusalem. And that's why I think that a mechanism of this kind could be applied. And today, it would be given priority over other questions. Fifthly, and very quickly, to accede to the specialized agencies, we could use that to put pressure on Israel. Israel has to attend. And we have to talk about the violation of international law and the resolutions adopted by the United Nations and its special agencies and others. Palestine must go along with the Rome Charter and should also become one of the main parties. 
And I'd finally like to emphasize and recommend Palestinian reconciliation. We think this is a key point in order to take charge of the situation. Because as long as the Palestinians are divided, the impact will be disastrous for the question of Jerusalem or for the conflict in general. And I must say, finally, that the way of getting Jerusalem back under uh, Palestinian, Arab, and Islamic uh, uh, control will mean that a lot of sacrifices are required by one and all. Sacrifices of selfishness, of slogans. We need work to continue all the time. There must be confidence, construction, and the presence of all the stakeholders. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Al Husseini. Okay, now um, our next speaker is His Excellency Mr. Mohammed Halaiki, a former minister and deputy prime minister and a former senator of the Kingdom of Jordan. Uh, he is currently the vice president of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Mediterranean and a member of the Jordanian House of Representatives, where he also acts as a chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. Mr. Halaiki is also chairman of the Sakini Society in Geo for Orphans and the deputy chairman of Jordan Transparency Association. Yeah, you have uh, the floor, sir. Bismillah, Mr. Chairman, uh, allow me please to uh, say a few words in Arabic uh, in my capacity as a member of the Jordanian Senate and a member of the Special Committee in Palestine before I put the other hat as the Vice President of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Mediterranean. I'm going to start my statement by extending my warm thanks to those who've organized this conference. The organizers are in the host country, the government of Turkey. And I would also like to remind you that this conference is being held very soon after another very important conference, which was held in Jordan, entitled The Road to Jerusalem which conference involved the participation of a large number of members of the international community, as well as certain people who are present here. The importance of this conference was that there were a certain number of recommendations which confirmed the rights of Muslims to visit the Al-Aqsa Mosque and support for the Palestinians. During the two days of meeting and discussion, although I think I'm one of those who've been following what's going on in Palestine, in view of the shortcomings, all those living outside Palestine and we're failing in our duty. I think it is very important to be aware of this situation and the status quo so that we can face up to Israeli oppression. It was also obvious how broad the Palestinian resistance is, particularly among the inhabitants of Jerusalem who are so brave. And it was also clear that we need these holy places, as was said yesterday. Uh, we must cover Jerusalem. We, as I've said, are failing in our duty because we talked about a certain number of families under the yoke of occupation with their electricity bills, their tax bills, which are enormous burdens. 
And as I said, if we were to replace the term Jerusalem in all these interventions, in all these conferences, in all these discussions which take place in the Arab and Muslim world, by one half a dollar of contribution, we'll see that Jerusalem would be in a better situation. The voice of Jordan is quite clear in its support for the Palestinians. Unfortunately, there's terrible silence from the Arab and Muslim countries. Obviously, there are exceptions, and Turkey is one of them. But as, as I said, there's silence in many Arab and Muslim countries. And that's why I very much hope that this conference will be a point of departure to show the status of Jerusalem and to show how Jerusalem is suffering. I'm now going to speak as vice chairman of the association. Inalienable rights of the Palestinian people and its chairman, Ambassador Diallo of Senegal for the active role in promoting the leg legitimate rights of the Palestinian people. It's a great honor for me to be here in Ankara in my capacity as the Vice President of PAM and to join your debates and deliberations on the question of Jerusalem. This is a fundamental issue in reaching a lasting and just peace in the region, together with the other four permanent issues, namely borders, refugees, water, and settlements. For decades, the international community has engaged in various attempts to find ways to make the holy city of Jerusalem a city of peace for all. We gather here today, ladies and gentlemen, while the region is passing through very difficult times, and to add to the political dilemmas of the region, failure of the negotiations between Palestinians and Israelis as yet another huge challenge for us all. Jerusalem has been always and will continue to be at the center of the Palestinian question. By failing to resolve this issue, future negotiations between the parties, if they take place, will inevitably fail. You should here have the courage to put the responsibility on the party who continues its occupation, building more settlements and changing the rules of the game each time a hope for peace glows. Still, we hope that peace will prevail in Palestine with the help of the international community. I would like to use this forum to highlight the role of parliamentary diplomacy and that of our assembly in particular. I will, I will highlight some aspects of the inter-parliamentary cooperation which is already in place in a bid to advance further the difficult process leading to a solution to the future of Jerusalem and the Palestinian-Israeli conflict in general. The role of non-traditional state actors, particularly that of parliamentarians, can indeed pave the way for dialogue and finding innovative solutions. PAM has always been committed to contribute to the Palestinian cause. There is a special ad hoc group in PAM within the mandate of the first standing committee of politics and security matters that I have the pleasure to preside dealing with this particular issue. This group operates to support the Palestinian cause and to facilitate as much as possible dialogue between the parties with the aim to achieve a just and permanent peace in the Middle East. We have attended and sincerely contributed to the outcome of your meetings in Geneva, Rome, and Vienna. With this aim in mind, several times and often, at the request of UN, PAM MPs have visited the region, including Gaza. Last November, a PAM high-level delegation visited Amman, Jordan, Ramallah, and Jerusalem. Our delegation, led by His Excellency Senator Francisco Amoroso of Italy, participated in constructive discussions with senior members of the executive body of the Palestinian Legislative Council and with the chief of staff of the Presidential Bureau of His Excellency, Mr. Mahmoud Abbas. Furthermore, in Jerusalem, delegates met with Ambassador Robert Surrey, 
the UN Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process, the Speaker of the Knesset, and Minister Livni, a preliminary meeting with the Jordanian Minister of Foreign Affairs took also place in Amman. Moreover, two PAM high-level missions visited both Cairo and Moscow in March and April of 2014. At both locations and in coordination with the UN, the Middle East process, the two-state solution, and the Syrian crisis were discussed with senior officials and with His Excellency Mr. Nabil Arabi, the Secretary General of the Arab League. Last December, the UN Secretary General received from our President a detailed briefing on the outcome of this mission during PAM's annual visit for New York for consultation with UN senior officials. During this mission, our delegation had also the privilege to meet and discuss with Ambassador Diallo Chamber, Chairman of your committee, the issue of Jerusalem and Palestine. And in that meeting, PAM and Malta were asked to assist in organizing for the second time a meeting to support the peace process based on the positive experience of that hosted in Malta 2010. Ladies and gentlemen, at PAM, we are convinced that resolving the question of Jerusalem is instrumental to the entire peace process, and therefore to achieve a much needed comprehensive peace in the Middle East. The main question is strongly relative to sovereignty. UN resolutions are very clear about that. The religious dimension could add to the radic radi radicalization of positions and to the an ab ability to reach an agreement. And we see that continuous Israeli assaults on Al-Aqsa Mosque and the holy places are condemned and, and are not acceptable at all. And they can only complicate further the prospects of peace, if any prospects are left. The US ambassador who attended our joint meeting in Malta had the audacity to say, can Jerusalem be an open city belonging to the entire humanity? It was indeed an interesting challenge to participants. So much has been said in Jerusalem. However, actions on the ground speak louder than words, no doubt. The core of peace is a sovereign Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital. This is the PAM position on that issue. PAM First Standing Committee dedicates particular attention to the plight of Palestinians and to the question of Jerusalem itself. PAM strives to play a constructive role by supporting and recognizing the idea that the two-state solution is the best viable solution. That is in the interest of both parties, the region and the entire world. There will be no real security for any of our states until the, Israel, the Arab-Israeli peace process is successful based on the two-state solution with East Jerusalem as the capital of Palestine. In this context, we have also to remember and admit that the Syrian crisis poses a great challenge to our security around the Mediterranean. Israeli and Palestinian leaders had in the past months shown their willingness to work together with the U.S. administration at addressing the key issues relevant to the peace process. Unfortunately, the direct negotiations have been recently interrupted. And here, we all agree, Pam, that it was the Israelis who let the negotiations fail by not fulfilling their commitments to what they have promised. Last week in Moscow, both the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs and the two branches of the Parliament have requested PAM to mobilize all its tools to ensure the door that still can be open for dialogue between parties, while the Quartet develops an alternative tool for negotiations should the direct talks fail. We are ready to, re we are ready to play this role to pursue the ideal of peace in the region. As indicated by the UN Secretary General, His Excellency Ban Ki-moon, it is crucial for PAM to promote dialogue, mutual understanding, and peaceful coexistence in the Mediterranean. Parliamentarians of the region have to shoulder their responsibility and encourage the idea that achieving peace is possible. 
the pivotal role of our assembly and all the international community is to build mutual trust and confidence between the two sides. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to conclude by emphasizing that our assembly is fully aware of the importance of Jerusalem and that any violent event in the city has the potential to spill beyond the boundaries of Israel and Palestine. For this, we call upon the Israelis to stop their assaults and respect the holy places and Al-Aqsa Mosque in particular and allow the Palestinians to practice their religion freely. For this reason, its future, Jerusalem's future, should not be unilaterally decided by any party or organization. This would result in only in violence and further distancing peace. PAM remains committed to the Middle East and we continue to direct our energies and parliamentary networking towards assisting the efforts of the international community, of your committee, and of all those who have the goodwill to achieve real peace in the region. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. I'd like to thank His Excellency, Mr. Halaka, for his contribution to it is a very important topic. And the organizer, organizers here appreciate the engagement of Parliamentary Assembly of the Mediterranean in support of the just solution of the Israel and Palestinian conflict. I would like again express my deep appreciation for your participation in this meeting. Now, for our last speaker, last but not least, we are honored to welcome Professor Guan Saak. He, was, uh, he is a profounding member of the Monetary Policy Council of the Central Bank, uh, Bank of Turkey. Um, Ms. Professor Saak is a, a professor of economics at the top university of economics and technology. And he is also managing a think tank in Ankara known as TEPAO. Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Jerusalem is dear to all of us. It was our first Kublai, so we can never forget Jerusalem. But today, you know, I agree with what all the other speakers have uh, talked about today, but I'm today I'm going to speak about the Jerusalemites and the economy of Jerusalem, basically. So I have a short presentation. Uh, let me start by saying that as uh, our chairman has noted, I'm an economist. So I don't know about the intricacies of the Jerusalem issue. I cannot talk about the issue like you. So I'm going to talk about what with the Turkish business community we have been doing in Palestine and what we would like to do further uh, and what we can do uh, in the case of uh, Jerusalem and what we can all do all together in the case of Jerusalem. I have chosen this title. That's what is important for Jerusalem, if you ask me. Jerusalem needs good jobs. Jerusalem needs inclusive growth. Because as Mr. Shreha has mentioned, when the Oslo Accord, for example, he mentioned about the increase in the number of settlers since the Oslo Accord was signed. When the Oslo Accord was signed, Jerusalem, East Jerusalem, represents about 15% of the Palestinian economy. Now it only represents about 7% of the Palestinian economy. So it got poorer in the meantime, in the last uh, two decades. And the East Jerusalemites have got to stay there. And in order to stay there, they have to uh, improve their living conditions. We have to find ways to improve their living conditions, basically. So that's why I have chosen this, because in order to have good jobs, you need to have good companies. And in order to have good companies in East Jerusalem, you need, we need to find a way to support Arab entrepreneurship, Palestinian entrepreneurship in Jerusalem, basically. So we need to focus on this issue also. This is the basic framework that I'm going to talk about today. Very briefly, very quickly, I, I first would like to underline a few issues about what we are doing in Palestine at the moment, because uh, let me introduce TEPAV also, it's the Economic Policy Research uh, Foundation of Turkey. 
we are basically focusing on economic policy issues and the regional integration of the Turkish economy. And in the last 10 years, we have been working together with the Chamber Federation of Turkey uh, to uh, improve uh, the economy of uh, Palestine, basically. And I have to tell you that uh, doing business in Palestine is not easy <laughs> under these conditions. <laughs> under the Israeli occupation. I have to uh, underline that issue. So I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about the role of Turkish private sector in Palestine. Then I'll come to, I'll give you some facts and figures uh, regarding uh, East Jerusalem, because, you know, it's good to talk about political settlement. It's good to foster for political settlement. But while we are waiting politi for political settlement, I think we also uh, need to take into account that the lives of East Jerusalemites uh, is deteriorating and we need to find a solution to that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that and then I'll speak about some concrete actions in moving forward just uh, for catalyzing investments to high growth Palestinian ventures and the possibility of establishing a, a Jerusalem Venture Capital Fund which we are now thinking about let's say, among ourselves in Ankara nowadays. We have started this process uh, about 10 years ago, uh, and uh, it is basically an institutional dialogue mechanism between the private sectors, uh, business communities of uh, uh, Israel, Turkey, and Palestine. And the, object, uh, the objective is to write reports network co uh, co coordination activity network to, to focus on co network coordination activities and focus on negotiations just to find ways to improve uh, private sector in uh, Palestine basically and we have started with this industrial zone project in 2005 it was in arrest first but you know the political situations our project landed uh, on a piece of land uh, in 2010 and we have only now in 2014 started investing some money. We have sent the first half of about, you know, uh, $10 million just about a month ago. And we are now working closely with both the German government and also the Palestinian government to start the activity there. And it's in Jenin now, because I have, when I have started the project, first it was in Gaza, but then when the political situation deteriorated there, uh, we now relocated the project after uh, some effort because I first went down to Tarkumia and now it's in Jenin and I'm working with the Germans there, with the German government there. And this is the place, it's a border estate and we are now trying to revitalize this, establish, develop an industrial uh, zone in this place. Uh, what we are doing is the German government is providing the off-site infrastructure and we are focusing on the on-site infrastructure and finding the right tenants. So we are about to start an investment promotion activity both in Turkey and also in other countries for this uh, place. And now let me give you some figures for Jerusalem because I think this uh, focus on uh, finding tenants for industrial estate there juxtaposes with the issue of Jerusalem also, for me at least, for the economy. Uh, there are about uh, 900,000 people living in Jerusalem uh, in 2013. So about these 40% of them are Palestinians. And, uh, uh, and they are young, basically. And the major factor is that if you look at the GDP per capita uh, in East Jerusalem, it's eight times lower than West Jerusalem. So it is uh, obvious that the East Jerusalemites are very much poorer when, it, uh, when you compare them with uh, the West Jerusalemites, basically. Uh, about 80% of non-Jewish Jerusalemites uh, live below the poverty line. And if you look at the business environment there, as I told you at the outset, in order to have good jobs, you know, in, in, in order to fight poverty, you, ne you need to have good companies. In order to have good companies, you need to have good entrepreneurs or entrepreneurship to develop in the region. But 75% uh, of the business owners in East Jerusalem noted that their revenues decreased in the past two years, basically. 
And I, I have noted that East Jerusalem is now a smaller portion of uh, the Palestinian economy, uh, basically. But there are areas uh, that can be considered for investment uh, in East Jerusalem, basically. And it's possible via good companies, if we can support good companies in East Jerusalem, it is possible to have good jobs in uh, East Jerusalem. It's possible to improve the living conditions of people in the region. And the issue about how we can look at this issue is this. Uh, you know, you need to look at the good jobs for development. You need first to have a look at whether there are enough good jobs uh, to move forward. If uh, there, are no, uh, there are enough jobs, then you don't need to do anything. Then, let me see. Then, you just, there is no need for an intervention. Then, but if it is not possible to have enough jobs, then you need to identify the constraints there. And if you can identify the constraints, you can focus on removing the constraints. But if it is not possible to remove the constraints, as in our case, then you need to find mechanisms to offset the constraints to improve the living conditions of the people. And that's what this whole project framework is basically focusing on. There are a few areas, as I told you, and let me give you just the facts and figures. Uh, if you look at tourism in East Jerusalem, for example, only 12% of tourists that are coming to Jerusalem stay in East Jerusalem. And uh, West Jerusalem has four times more rooms than East Jerusalem when it comes to uh, hotels, hotel capacity, basically. And tourists stay 20% longer in uh, West Jerusalem hotels. And there is the need to improve uh, the whole tourism industry. And it's not only about the existing hotels. It's not only about the new facilities. But there is the need to improve and invest the related sectors, too, in the case of Palestine. Because I have been visiting, for example, Palestine in the last 12 years. There is the need to improve everything, from taxi, from taxi companies uh, to you name it. You know, uh, finding uh, people, drivers who knows about the region, who can easily take you to places, and who can also speak in English, other, uh, some language other than uh, Arabic. I think these things are also very much important. And it is possible to do this in the case of Palestine. There is also need for cheap housing units in Palestine, in East Jerusalem again. Arabs constitute about 35% of Jerusalem's population, but they occupy, they reside only in 24% of the houses. So most Arab families are living in cramped conditions. About uh, six people uh, on average, five and a half, five, half uh, people living uh, in, uh, in, in one house on average. And only 13% of East Jerusalem is available to be built, to be built for housing purposes for the Palestinians, basically. I think these things, these issues, and according to a study, by 2020, there is the need for 40,000 new housing units in uh, the case of East Jerusalem. So if you want the Palestinians, East Jerusalemites, to stay there, we need to improve these uh, conditions, basically. And when it comes to ICT, again, there are opportunities in this uh, communications technology. Uh, and Jerusalem is a nice place to focus on this issue. I'll come to that, I think, at the very end. There are about 141 million Arabic users on the internet, and the proportion of Arab speakers online grew 30-fold between 20, 2000 to 2012. So there is the need for Arabic content, basically, in the case of internet, and it is possible to provide those services. Jordanians are now focusing on the, that issue but it is possible to share a portion of that uh, with uh, the people living in East Jerusalem, uh, basically. Uh, so I think this is also uh, a good uh, starting point. There are already ICT sector that's strengthening in nearby cities. There are investments in Palestinian startups in Ramallah nowadays. And on, on the Israeli side, there are Israeli Arab startups in Nazareth. So it is possible to focus on the same issue in the case of uh, East Jerusalem, basically. What can be done is to focus on this kind of a Jerusalem fund for Arab or Palestinian, uh, Arab Palestinian entrepreneurship. So if it is not possible 
to trigger full-scale reforms if it is not possible to find the final solution very quickly at this stage, then uh, supporting high-growth companies looks to be the most effective policy for institutional change in any place, in any place. While focusing on this uh, Jerusalem issue, while focusing on these negotiations, I think, as these people are kind of watchmen waiting in East Jerusalem, we need to, for, we need to find ways to support them, to support their livelihood there. So the mission for a Jerusalem fund could be to uh, contribute to the modernization of regional economies through investments. It's about improving the local uh, SMEs, competitiveness and access to international markets. It's about supporting entrepreneurship and therefore middle class uh, and in turn contribute to stability and democratization also in the same place in East Jerusalem and in the region. And the structure is basically at the outset could be to co-invest with private investors, something like this. If you have a fund like this, and there are other investors, obviously, just you use the fund to share the risks that those other investors are taking up upon themselves by uh, acting as a co-investor together with those uh, direct investors to Palestinian companies in, in East Jerusalem, basically. And it is possible to find funds from sovereign wealth funds and also from private investors. So when it comes to uh, strengthening companies in, 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 in Palestine, I think it is important to find some risk-sharing mechanisms uh, with the investors uh, that are going to uh, take hard business decisions in the case of uh, Jerusalem, East Jerusalem. And there are many examples of these. There is one in Japan for example, they did the similar thing to just to uh, improve the Japanese economy's strategy of uh, improving the value chains in the region. This one is for Mediterranean. The Catalans in Barcelona have established that one, and they are very active in, in both in Morocco, Algeria, in, all, all in, in, in North Africa, basically. And Russia has a similar uh, venture company that's uh, operating uh, in, uh, in, in in, in, in other places. So let me conclude very quickly. I think it is important to focus on good job creation, creation of good jobs in Jerusalem, East, in East Jerusalem also. And that requires good companies to flourish. And there is the need to focus also, uh, with, among other, all the other things, to focus on private sector-based economic activity in the case of Palestine as a whole. Currently, currently there are constraints for uh, private sector-based economic activity. Occupation is definitely one major constraint specific to Palestine. And location is also a major constraint around the globe in all the places. I am now focusing on bringing companies, uh, not only Turkish but international companies, to Jenin. We are now focusing on these, these uh, activities to sell that location to, to foreigners. And I think Jerusalem is very easy when compared to Jenin uh, in terms of bringing foreign, foreigners, foreign investors into. So if you cannot remove the constraint immediately, then you need to find a way to offset that constraint. There is the need for a role uh, for, a, for a more active government in supporting economic activity. There is the need for market-based risk-sharing mechanism like the Jerusalem fund that, the fund that I have mentioned. And also, this is an age where this corporate social responsibility is very much important. And I think Jerusalem is a corporate social responsibility project for all of us, for all the business people in our part of the world, basically. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Gransak, for your very informative and constructive uh, contribution to the, our meeting, uh, underlining the role of the economy and business as a problem-solving uh, and confidence-building mechanism. <laughs> well, actually, we have finished our, our um, uh, uh, presentation, but now um, we have a, a quite limited time for question and answer. And since we have uh, quite a limited time, um, I'm sorry that I, I'm going to take only two questions. Two. 
Yeah, two brief questions, please. Yeah. Yes, please. And please um, ask, I mean, tell your, um, why are you asking your question, rising question? Yes. To, to the prayer, yeah, the name of the doctor. My question is going to be to, the, to Dr. Sarik regarding the uh, proposed economic plan. I would like to say that any economic activity is welcomed in Palestine. However, we do not want to fall prey to the issue of perpetuating Israel's domination. Our experience with Israel has so far in joint industrial zones and in other projects, even in tourism, is that they use the Palestinian willingness to develop in order to control. So what we ask you is please, in every effort, make sure that you do not do any harm to the Palestinian cause because in the tourism sector, I want to tell you this very little story. It works one way. Palestine is open to all the Israeli tour buses, but not one single Palestinian tourist guide is allowed to enter Israel. So it always works to the benefit of Israelis. And we want to create jobs internally. We welcome cooperation, we welcome joint venture. We would like to develop Palestine but not at the, expense, at the expense of our potential independence. Mubassal al-Jama'a Arabiya fi Ankara. Ladaya ta'qib. Comment? Representative uh, here in Ankara, I have one comment I'd like to make. We have received a draft recommendation. I would like to see these recommendations reflect the discussions and the uh, statements which were extremely valuable and which have been presented by <coughs> speakers at this conference. I would also like to see it translated into Arabic and English because we're working under the auspices of the United Nations. I have a recommendation, if I may, about the visit of the Pope. I think it would be a good thing, it would be timely to include a recommendation to the effect that this visit should be a historic uh, visit and that it should include a claim, uh, a request for by the Pope to make access freer for Christians and uh, Muslims for in order for them to be able to practice their religion there. And I'd like to thank the government of Turkey for organizing this conference, along with the United Nations and the OIC. I would be remiss if I did not uh, thank Turkey also for all of their efforts aimed at supporting our um, brothers from Palestine. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to uh, shed a little light on the discussion earlier. I think it's very important that we speak about the uh, sort of economic linkages between Jerusalem and the rest of the Palestinian territory as well as the rest of the world. Obviously, you need to have two dimensions. One is a public investment program and the other is a private sector program. And our brother and friend, uh, the outline that he has provided, I think it is very important, crucial for the steady fastness of the people in the city. But I think I should mention to you that President Abu Mazen, under his uh, patronage, he announced the establishment of a special fund for Jerusalem from the Palestinian private sector and uh, a total of uh, 58 million dollars were collected uh, from the Palestinian private sector as well as contribution from the Palestinian government. Uh, this fund is going also, or donations will be touring Jordan, Saudi Arabia, 
uh, Turkey as well. We spoke about it with the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Ahmed Daoud Oglu. And I hope that we really come to the idea where not only we create jobs in Jerusalem, but we really create some sort of economic linkages between Jerusalem and the rest of the Palestinian territory and bring Jerusalem back into the economic social fabric of the Palestinian society. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your active presentation in the afternoon session. And a special thanks to our distinguished panelists who shared their expertise with us. This concludes our plenary third deliberations. On behalf of Turkish government, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, and the Committee on the Exercise of Inalienable Rights of the Palestinian People, I would like to express my deep appreciation to the distinguished speakers who shared their knowledge and experience in this very important plenary uh, session. Many thanks also go to those participants who can contribute to the discussion and to all of you for your interest and attention. Okay, we will adjourn now for a break uh, of 15 minutes, five minutes, sorry, five minutes, 15, okay. Now, the last decision is 15 minutes. <laughs> Not 50, but 15. <laughs> Still. 15 yeah, okay. And while the room is being prepared for the closing session, the closing will start promptly at 5.15 p.m. Okay, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much.